This week we talk with author Kent Nurburn about the 25th anniversary edition of his book, Neither Wolf Nor Dog, on Forgotten Roads with an Indian Elder. Kent muses about some of the reasons this book has had such an impact. It really looks at the Native experience from two points of view. Essentially, I hand the reader off to the Native voices, and the Natives speak back to them. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my mother and co-host, Caroline Kilborn. And hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess winter has arrived in the Midwest. For like the second or third time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it keeps getting... Okay. It keeps getting cold, then warm, then cold, then warm. But now you may you may notice um, that my voice sounds a little different this morning. I had a we had our company party last night, and because I was trying to talk to people so much, and there was music playing, so I was straining my voice, and you can tell. Oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. can. That's right. And yeah. and it was kind of in, kind of interesting because in the in our book today when I was reading it um, there was a section about how white people talk too much and so maybe I yeah kind of right that yeah I, earlier. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I made that was in my notes and then and it's true it is true it's true <laughs> so our guest today is Kent Nurburn and he's the author of neither wolf nor dog on forgotten roads with an Indian elder and this is being released in a 25th anniversary edition now, Kent is um, widely recognized as one of the few American writers who can respectfully bridge the gap between Native and non-Native cultures. He is the author or editor of 15 books on spirituality and Native themes, including Chief Joseph and the Flight of the Nez Perce, Simple Truths, Small Graces, and Letters to My Son. The volumes in his groundbreaking trilogy, which this book, Neither Wolf Nor Dog on Forgotten Roads with an Indian, Indian Elder, is the first of that trilogy, I believe, are considered core works in the multicultural curriculum of schools and colleges around the world. After 25 years in the rugged lake country of northwestern Minnesota, he and his wife have moved to the cedar-scented richness of the Pacific Northwest with their elderly yellow lab, Lucy. And you can find out more about Kent at his website, www.kentnerburn.com. That's N-E-R-B-U-R-N. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Kent. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'll let you know that uh, your, your, this conversation is uh, at the expense of my elderly yellow lab, Lucy, who's staring at me through a window wanting to go for a walk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but she doesn't have... I, she, She's got almost all the treads off her tires, and she doesn't have too much time left. So I try to get her out four times a day, and uh, good old girl. And anyone who has an old dog knows oh. how that is. Yeah. Well, yeah. and labs are just yeah, she's a dogs. sweetheart. Yeah, yeah. So this book is is required required reading in American history courses. Uh, one of my <laughs> one of my notes was it should be. <laughs> <laughs> In some ways, it was a blind pig, uh, blind pig in an acorn kind of book for me. I had no idea when I wrote it what I had, but now it's been used. Uh, oh my word! It's been used in colleges uh, all throughout the colleges and high schools all throughout the U.S. Uh, the tribal colleges use it. Uh, it. It goes into the multicultural curricula of various schools because it really looks at the Native experience from two points of view. It looks at right, it from our right. point of view, the non-Native uh, person, and the Native people. The accidental genius of the book is that uh, I say to you as the non-Native reader, come, come along with me, uh, leave the gap in the TJ Maxx and your Walgreens, and let's get in the car, and we're going to go for a ride, and I'm going to hand you off to some people and take you to a place that you've never been. And then given my background in working in oral history, essentially I hand the reader off to the Native voices, and the Natives speak back to them. And as a result, the non-Native reader gets to see from their own point of view, because I am that point of view, and the Native reader 
says, yes, this is my voice. This is my story. Someone is finally articulating it in a way that allows me to give expression to what's in my experience and heart. So you're really seeing through two sets of eyes. And that's uh, it's made it a very valuable book for people and teachers who want to bring it into a classroom and let their students learn something about the Native experience. Right. Well, and individuals, I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I really, really enjoyed this book, and uh, I think Monica can tell you because I made a lot of notes in the book, didn't I, dear? <laughs> you did, and also when she was when she had the book and she was reading it, she kept saying, "Oh my, there's so much in this book. There's so much to this." Um, <laughs> and it's interesting that that the story is as um, what do you say as vital today as it was 25 years ago. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing in some, in no, some in, respects. In the broader sense, no. <laughs> but as far as a writer, I, I really right. <laughs> try, try not to be time-bound in, in what I do. I want it to have a universality and a universal application so someone picking it up uh, it doesn't think they're looking at an archaic uh, you know, mm-hmm. intellectual archaeology, something of some sort from the past. It, it should be alive and it should be vibrant. And the native issues uh, really haven't changed that much. They've come to the fore a little more, but they're, they're, the issues that they have to face are the same. And also the, the richness and depth of their way of understanding the world, has it, it's timeless. And that's the other side that I try to bring out in the, in the course of the book is what, what it is that they have to offer us as a dominant culture. And of course, when I said that that it was still as relevant now and as vital, what I that and that it wasn't necessarily a good thing, I was referring to the fact that there hasn't been that much improvement in right mm-hmm. in you know in the issues that that the Native Americans face, especially you know in recent years with the pipelines, the the lack of of understanding of why. These, they don't want the pipelines disturbing mm-hmm. sacred lands, and right. <laughs> you know we had um, we had a president who had some respect for that, and now we have one that has none. None whatsoever. Well, <laughs> his lack of respect for is, is, is democratic. It's for all people and all things other than himself. But that, that's <laughs> going down a different road. We'll stay away that from is. him for a while. <laughs> He's, yeah. he's poisoned all of our minds and spirits, and we'll try to leave him alone for a little while. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a good idea. That's a good idea. So, Kent, what drew you to writing about Native peoples? Well, it was, it was an accident, uh, really. I had no uh, growing. Up, well, I grew up in the in the suburbs of Minneapolis and had no more relationship to native people than any other little post-war suburban rug rat would. You know, we had uh, bows and arrows with little red rubber tips and uh, we you know, wore headdresses uh, for Thanksgiving and uh, we learned about, uh, about Indians and then the, uh, sharing a turkey with uh, some people in uh, you know, big silver buckle shoes and tall hats and that was everything I knew. And I never thought much about them. They weren't even on my radar. But I, it, it, it was a long and circuitous route that I ended up, I was going to graduate school uh, in religious studies and humanities and or religious studies at uh, Graduate Theological Union and UC Berkeley, a combined program. And I was doing religious sculpture. That, that's what interested me. And that religion in the broadest sense of the term, I wanted to do sculpture that embodied spiritual understanding and spiritual states. And what, in, in the, I, I worked in wood. And wood was my, uh, you know, I worked in trees. I didn't want to work in laminated uh, wood. I, they were life-size figures. And, when, and I worked with hand chisels because I wanted a direct relationship to the medium. And in the course of working on the wood, we're trying to, apply my own ideas and visions to the wood, the wood started speaking back to me. You see, you don't sit with a tree or anything. You don't sit in a room with anything for six months and not have it. I develop a real, not develop a real intimacy with it. Well, in the course of working on trees, I discovered that the trees 
talk back to me in a very fundamental way. They would speak their their character would show up, their individual character, the character of the species. I remember working on one tree that was a tremendously sad tree. It was a, it was a, a piece of oak and it had a terrible life. And that that isn't a literary conceit. It smelled bad. It felt bad. It was punky when I worked on it. There were knots. It, it was a sad tree. And this sort of awareness of a different way of understanding the natural force of a tree really struck me. And no one spoke about this. So anyway, in, in the course of working as a sculptor, I like to say that sculpture is one notch above being a, being a sculptor is one notch above being a composer or a poet on the economic food chain. And uh, <laughs> I ended up... Uh, an opportunity came. My wife and I were living in northwestern Minnesota. We'd moved up there, and we were 100 miles from the nearest freeway, 100 miles from the Canadian border. And an opportunity came to work on the Red Lake Reservation uh, to help collect the memory of the tribal elders. And I took it. It was a, it was a grant-based job, and I and I tried to do what was done in the Foxfire books. If you remember those, you know, the fellow who went out, I think it was in Georgia, and took students out and and interviewed the folks in the hills and the Appalachians about uh, their lifestyle and the things they did. And I asked, uh, I proposed that I do the same thing as a way of letting the students learn their native history because I didn't want to impose my own values on things. So for a few years, I did that. And in the course of that, I discovered two very fundamental truths about the native experience. And one was that it had been essentially expunged from our own historical narrative because we as a people of progress and optimism don't want to face what it is uh, you know we've done the blood that's on the ground for we've walked in our passage across this country and the other thing is that there were some incredibly fundamental core values that these people had that were worth sharing uh, and that we all needed to learn from and that would benefit us as, as a nation so anyway I, it became so essential to me that I sort of put down my chisels and took up the pen and said, you know, I can give voice to this. Mm-hmm. And I want to write about what it is I've seen, what it is I've learned. And that was a, and th- that was the turning point. And from that point, I stayed with writing about uh, the Native experience and the spiritual dimension of uh, what the Native people have to offer for the last 30 years. So you really didn't set out to be a writer? Absolutely not. No, uh, sculpture uh, uh, was sculpture was more important to me, and that and something about that medium fascinated me. But I wasn't a natural. You know, I, I I had moments where I would create something brilliant, but very often I just didn't didn't have the eye. I didn't have the natural feel. But I'd spent my whole life writing. Uh, I'd written. It had been my job during college. I'd worked on the campus newspaper and the campus uh, magazine. I'd been a writer for a strange job after college on the Governor's Crime Commission, being a writer and editor for them at the state of Minnesota. I'd done pickup jobs as a writer always. And it was like a, I was like a uh, musician who spent his life playing scales. And then one day someone said, uh, well, why don't you try doing making an actual composition? And so I, I had all my chops as a writer. And then I just, and, and I was much more natural. It was, it was an easier craft for me. So no, I had no, no sense of being a writer. I'm not one of those people who set out to do it. But to be a writer, had that dream of, oh, someday I want to be a writer. But what is interesting is that my doctorate was really in, was in religion and art. And it, it spoke to the, to the, different modalities of artistic expression. And so studying sculpture, uh, really moving over to writing was just becoming a sculptor with words. And the way I write is as a visual artist. It's all very visual. It's all, I should say, it's very sensory. Uh, But I write with an eye to, I, I always put a reader as a writer, I put myself inside an event. I want you to be on the ground, walking through it, and looking at it, smelling it, feeling it, tasting it. And that really is just uh, my training as a sculptor uh, being moved over into a different medium. So it was not a difficult shift. 
It's just that that isn't where I started out, but it's where I've ended up. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Kent Nurburn, author of Neither Wolf Nor Dog on Forgotten Roads with an Indian Elder. Kent, my father sculpted in wood. Uh Uh-huh. Which, you know, with with chisels, with hand chisels. Um, Small, on a fairly small scale, and like most of his works were um, kind of reliefs, uh, maybe eight by ten, or the large one of the larger mm-hmm. ones is probably fourteen by twenty, or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful art form, but um, not an easy way to make a living. That would be that, no, I don't no. think he ever. I don't think he ever tried to do that, but that was one of his uh, one of his avocations. Well, and and you're there, and that that whole area of Iowa is a strong area for uh, for crafts people working in wood. I think of the Vesterheim Museum and uh, places that just uh, it, it somehow it draws people. Different environments draw people to different art forms. Well, he was and, actually uh, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania at the time, ah, but that, but famous. that area is also, you're right, mm-hmm. you're right, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, and that was one of the interesting things about right, uh, switching to writing in northern Minnesota. It was not an environment that uh, that had a visual, it, it wasn't visually nourishing for a sculptor. It was mm-hmm. wonderful for painters and very good for writers because of the sense of distance and reflection that it had available. But it was just, it, 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 it didn't nourish me as a sculptor. But once I started writing, the landscape and the change of seasons and the uh, just the human drama and natural drama of that uh, sort of bleak northwestern Minnesota landscape with its uh, exposure to the prairies on one side and the forests on the other side really drew out something and made writing a a wonderful uh, a wonderful craft to pursue. Mom, what were some of the other things that really jumped out at you as you were reading? When Dan, when the, the, the elder called his dog by telepathy, <laughs> mm-hmm. I thought that was, that was amazing. Well, you know, this is something that you see, uh, and, and I get into it much more in the third book in the trilogy, uh, The Grim of Saint of the Buffalo, um, where, and actually the, it was something of that kind of power among some of the elder natives that caused me to finish the trilogy and say, no, I'm not going any further. There were people who literally, like I remember one man saying to me, uh, he sent his wife, I forget what the circumstances were, but he was an Ojibwe man. And he said, he said, I sent my wife to check this guy out last night. And I said, I, I, again, I can't remember the specifics of the circumstance, but what was important was that, he, that his, this person he was checking out was somewhere in Wisconsin. And I said, well, how'd you do that? He said, oh, well, we just, tra- we just travel that way spiritually. And I can't, I can't doubt that. I can't question it. Uh, it's outside of my sort of uh, Western rational mindset. But the capacity yeah. to, uh, you know, this sort of thing you've heard very frequently. There are people for whom, and Dan you know, is an example, for whom the presence of graves uh, they can feel the presence of graves. They can feel the presence under the earth. Just like there are people who are dowsers who can go along and find water. Uh, there are native folks, especially the older ones, who uh, have this capacity to feel uh, forces that the rest of us don't feel. And you just have to get humble in the face of that when you confront it. And there's a lot of charlatans and a lot of monkeys who attempt to uh, you know, act that way. Because there are the real ones, and these are the people where you know you bend the knee before their knowledge and uh, way of understanding. And once having confronted it, you I mean you have to look at it with a real serious eye and say there you know uh, there are more things to ratio than heaven and earth that are dreamt of in our philosophy. That's right. Kent, tell us a little bit about how this trilogy came to be. Well, when the origin really was uh, from the oral history books that I did on the Red Lake Reservation. Uh, what the project 
when I proposed it, we for to go out and speak to the elders. Uh, what I said that I wanted to do is uh, create a book of their thoughts and memories. Now, I don't want to make it sound like it's some deep, profound, this was some deep, profound book. It was just the kids taking tape recorders and going and talking to their parents and grandparents. And sometimes we'd go out together and sit around with them uh, and have them tell us stories. And they ranged for things about how when they were young, they used to take turtle shells and slide down the snow into the, into the red lake in the winter uh, onto the ice. And sometimes they'd speak of uh, deeper teachings that they had learned, but it was just whatever amalgam of things we could find. Uh, and we put them together in this book. The school board was kind enough to let us publish this book that uh, there were two, and the first one was called To Walk the Red Road. And uh, we, uh, so when this book got done, uh, everyone was rightly proud of it. No one had ever done anything quite like this with students uh, on the reservations before. And it started to travel around. It got taken out on the Powell Highway uh, and then the Powell Circuit in the summer. Uh, kids would send it to their relatives. It had photos and text. And so a lot of the older folks who uh, couldn't read very well, they could see pictures of them, of themselves and their grandparents and the, their families. And the book was widely beloved. Well, that, that book was really the source point for neither wolf nor dog, because when I left the reservation, it turns out that book had been found by a, a native elder who I call Dan. And uh, he had, uh, through Dan, he requested that I help him put down, or that I put down the thoughts and teachings of the native people. He thought I had done something important. And uh, he said, well, I have some things I'd like to say as well. So that's neither wolf nor dog grew out of that book. And it really was a book speaking of their way of looking at the world, the uh, telling of their values and their way of looking at the world that we take for granted, uh, talking about things like their way of understanding leadership, uh, the difference between land and property, that we understood property, they understood land, uh, the difference between our people seeking freedom when we came here, their people being bound by honor. And so this that was the source, that was really the core of neither wolf nor dog. The second book, Wolf at Twilight, was a book that was done in response to this, the re people, readers looked at neither wolf nor dog and said, oh, all those Indians are so wise. They have such wonderful spirituality. I said, no, that's not really what it is. That's true. There's some wisdom in that. But also, there's a great darkness to their experience. And that darkness is, not, is, is pretty much embodied in the boarding school experience, the Indian boarding school experience, mm -hmm. about which our dominant culture knows almost nothing. And so the second book, The Wolf of Twilight, takes you through Dan, into the boarding school experience. And the third, the girl was saying to the buffalo, is really a book walking you and walking the reader and me up to that edge of that deeper spiritual understanding, the one I just referred to about the, uh, uh, the one that you talked to about Dan being able to call the dog through telepathy. And this, these sort of truths of in spiritual capabilities that are not ours to understand, but do exist. And when I got to those, I said, that's as far as I can go. I'm not going any further. I can't cross into this. I just have to get to the edge and point to it. And girl was saying to the buffalo, points to that through a little girl uh, who may be somewhere on the autism spectrum, uh, may have some spiritual powers. It's hard to say. So that was what the first of those, that's how those three books came into being. They all came out of a simple oral history project, uh, up in the woods and lake country of northern Minnesota. Now, when, when Dan reached out to you to help him kind of convey his thoughts, and, and he had written quite a lot and initially just asked you to sort of edit his work. Why did you well, agree actually, to do that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, oh. actually, it, it, it wasn't, it turns out it wasn't his work. It was the, the writings of his son. Uh, who had tried to collect those his thoughts and words, and he had kept that. Uh, 
uh, this is the vehicle for explaining the story that they, that he, his son who had died, who was about my age, uh, had put all of these materials in, into a shoebox and, uh, Dan had them and he wanted someone to try to deal with them. And that was how they landed in my lap. And, you know, I, I, I feel that once I got involved in working with native people, uh, I found that I was doing something that seemed to me that I had the skills to, to do. I had the talent. I was in the right place at the right time. And it felt like something that wasn't just important. It felt like something that was essential. So from that point forward, uh, whenever I've been called as a non-Native person to do something, to give voice to Native thinking, to serve as an interpreter, uh, to speak to or from their point of view, I do it because that, that's, that's my moral responsibility in the world. That's been the task that I've been given. It wasn't what I set out to do. I set out to make uh, religious sculpture. But now th- this is, you know, this is what I've been doing for 30 years, and it feels like you know, it's my way of paying rent on earth, and I hope I'm doing a good job. Well, obviously you have been doing a good job. Is it one of the, one of the issues that's raised in the book you know, in your kind of relationship with Dan and with the other um, natives in this book is is the idea that so many white people kind of use the native experience, the native spirituality to fill something lacking in their own life and um, mm-hmm. that that is somewhat problematic. Do you want to, could you could you talk about that a little bit and how you've been able to... Um, to sort of get past that? Well, sure. You know, the, the, that's something that my thinking has evolved. That, that, you know, understand this book was written 25 years ago, and my experience has changed, my understanding has changed and deepened, and that's one of those subjects that, that, that has evolved a bit. I mean, it's, it's always been fascinating that, that Amer- America goes in these ebbs and flows towards the native people. For a while, they are the, they're the untutored savage, and then they become the wise men and earth mothers. And we go back and forth in this regard. And right now, we've sort of got a, a dual pull of one group of people saying, oh, the natives are such a, they, they have such wisdom and spirituality. And another one saying, you know, why don't they get over it? You know, they're just drunk with a bunch of casinos and trying to get free money. And uh, I, you know, but there, there is this whole history of us wanting something exotic in our spirituality. And that Dan you two would talk about uh, them being the jewelry on, you know, on the wrist of American culture because they wanted something that spoke of exoticism, that spoke of nature, and, and that we have, we have a hunger. We have a hunger for a spirituality is more comfortable and that we can wear more comfortably than an imported spirituality from a desert culture in the Middle East. And I, you know, and I've always, you know, I always thought this was kind of, uh, kind of the way it is, but I've, I've come to see it as being, there's, there's something more going on there. And that is that we're now at a very interesting stage in our culture where if you are a believer that, that they're written, we're, we're, we're divided into two camps. We're divided into people who are sort of believers in religion and theology, and uh, then we're both believers in the other camp is history, or is, should I say, is science and evolution and first principles. And we really have no place to go if we're a person that believes, if we are people that believe in a creative force and the power of a creative mystery and a creative origin that has an animating principle that isn't some bloodless evolutionary model, but there is a creator. And the native people allow us to think about the great mystery, to think about a creative force at the heart of our uh, human existence. And so people gravitate to it because of the desire to believe that there is something that, or to embrace a way of understanding that has a spiritual source to it without, you know, 
having to grab onto a god with a white beard or a, a god of ideology of some sort. And so we've taken we've taken the native way. I think the native way is now serving to offer us a way into a spiritual understanding of life that isn't uh, that that isn't based on mythologies, that isn't based on uh, you know ideological boundaries. So it's been it's been something that I think has it came to us first as a kind of an exotic way to uh, you know, expand our own sort of rational existence, but it's become a way to actually have a theological grounding without having an ideology behind it. So you feel do do you feel that it's more sort of acceptable now for white people to kind of take on this native spirituality? Well, it's you know it it really depends on how you look at it. My 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 initial position was has always been one that Dan had, and that was that uh, that you've taken everything away from us. You meaning we as the as the dominant culture. You took our land. You took our children. You took everything, and now you're coming for our beliefs. Just leave us something of who we are and what we are. And yet there's always been another school of thought among the Native people who say that uh, we you know, this was the gift that the Creator gave us. Our spirituality is the gift that we were given, and it's our responsibility to share it. And uh, that we we need to teach these people who are, you know, who are lost in their own kind of wilderness. And I, I have a friend, uh, uh, a good friend of mine who's a Clinkett man. He's about my age. Uh, he, he's a, a in Alaska, he lives in Alaska, and he had a Shoshone teacher, and he said, uh, and I actually used this quote at the start of one of my books, Voices in the Stones, which is really about my learning experiences I've had learning from Native people, and I use this as the lead quote, and the Shoshone elders said, uh, do not begrudge the white man his presence on this land, though he doesn't know it yet, he came here to learn from us. And I really have come to think that way, that they have uh, they have an understanding of spirit, an acceptance of spirit, the presence of spirit in every living thing. They have a broader understanding of family. They uh, have a belief that uh, status is not important. The quality of heart is more important than accomplishment and quality of mind. There are many aspects to the Native experience that I think are there for us to benefit from. And one of them is the, uh, their spiritual relationship to the land. And that's where I think we have more claim to uh, embrace the Native way of understanding because we're not really appropriating their, their belief structure at that point so much as we're listening to them. You mentioned the pipeline, and the pipeline is a perfect example. Here we have our... Our science and our, uh, our technology saying, oh, we can run a pipeline under a river. Uh, nothing bad will happen. Well, can you say uh, Three Mile Island? Can you say Fukushima? Uh, I mean, bad things happen. Our technology, if technology is a god, it's a flawed god. Whereas the Native people are saying, no, listen to the land here. Respect the Missouri as the, the, the mother river the giver of life, the bringer of life. And the more we start to hear that way of understanding of the land and that respect and humility before the presence and power and eternity of the land, uh, the better off we're going to be as a people. Other than that, we're going to come up against the sorry end, I'm afraid. So anyway, I think, yes, that's true. we should not try to take on the trappings or the specific content of the native way native spirituality and native way of understanding but we should listen to the source points and their mm -hmm. willingness to listen to the land to be humble before the creative forces that are around us in the seasons the land and uh, and all the living things you're listening to writers voices with monica and caroline and our guest today is kent nurburn author of neither wolf nor dog on forgotten roads with an indian elder which has just been released in a 25th anniversary edition with a uh, foreword by musician Robert Plant. 
<laughs> yeah. And, can I tell you a little story on that? Is sure. That, 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 that to me, is such, is such a fascinating story. Uh, I, I got a call one day from the publisher, and this happens periodically, and said, they'll say, uh, there's someone who wants to talk to you, and sometimes it's good-hearted people, sometimes it's insane people. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you just uh, say, okay. Uh, and I said, well, who is this? They said, well, it's, it's, it was someone's publicist. They said he's some well-known musician. They said, well, okay, who is it? They said, well, his name is Robert Plant. I said, oh, you mean like the Led Zeppelin guy? Uh, I'd never been a big Led Zeppelin fan when I was younger. Uh, you know, I knew who they were, but to me, they were just guys with long hair that uh, made kind of screaming rock music and, uh, you know, <laughs> kicked holes through walls and in hotels. And I was much more of the, the beatnik and Bob Dylan school of music. So anyway, I was not impressed with the fact of this guy being Robert Plant. Eh? But so anyway, okay, sure, I'll talk to him. So I get in touch with Robert. He, he gets in touch with me on the phone, and uh, he's, he apparently had found neither wolf nor dog in tattered cover in uh, the bookstore in Denver. And he loved the book, and the, he had been reading it to everyone on the tour bus. He was touring out east. And he asked if he could, uh, you know, uh, he said, well, will you be speaking anywhere, like uh, on Red Lake? Because I said, well, no speaking on Red Lake, but I will be at the South Dakota Festival of the Book. He said, well, perhaps I'll pop out. And so, sure enough, Robert showed up at the South Dakota Festival of the Book in Deadwood, and he stayed pretty much out of sight, uh, came to my talk, and I got to know him, and he was a very intelligent, insightful, and kind man, quite unlike what I had expected. So, anyway, at the end of the conference, I said, you know, you got a little time? He said, Sure. And I said, would you like to go down to the, uh, we'll, we'll go down to Pine Ridge and I'll take you to Wounded Knee and maybe introduce you to some folks. And so we did. We traveled together for three days um, and ended up down at Wounded Knee on uh, the night of the blood moon in uh, September. And it was a very powerful experience. And Robert was able to travel and be relaxed and uh just not be known and he can't go anywhere in the world without being spotted the second he steps out into the street and we got to know each other very well and so I really liked him he liked me and since that time I've been over to England and and gone and gone and been to his, you know, his town and uh, he and I have been together at the Hay Literary Festival where he spoke of the book and the reason the book became it got published in England because Robert was such a champion for it that he took it to very prestigious press, the Canongate, uh, Canongate publications, the ones that have done the Book of Pi, uh, and they publish Annie Dillard in uh, England. They, they're very high quality press and they love the book. So they put out, uh, Neither Wolf or Dog in, in Great Britain and, uh, you know, and it licensed it through their title to the rest of the, the, through their publisher, publishing company of the rest of the world, and they asked him if he would write an introduction to it or a foreword. And he sat down to try to write it, and he kept coming up, he ended up saying to them, I can't get anything, I've just got a bunch of scribbled notes. And so I said, you know, I said, well, I'll just send them to me, I'll take a look at them. And I looked at them, and uh, they were, you know, it, I said, this is a poem. You know, he, he thinks they're just chicken scratches. But they, it really is a, you know, it, it's a song lyric. It's a poem. And in fact, you know, uh, it's very short. How about if I read it? Is that okay? Yes, that'd be great. Yeah, it's a, it, it, because I, I like it a lot. It's a forward, The Voice of the Native Heart by Robert Plant. It's a dirty, familiar history, a story of broken treaties, idiot expansion, collision, and relocation, of abuse, denial, and unfair advantage as far from the Lone Ranger as one can imagine. For almost 50 years, on journeys through the extremes of the New World, I wrestled with the questions that carried the weight of empire. For many years, Kent Nirvan, too, has been immersed in the inflamed frontier that separates and divides. Neither Wolf nor Dog takes us on a real-life journey, playing out the exhausted residue of the push and pull between our cultures, bringing into sharp focus the fall-off from the European slog, consuming lurch and stampede for more. 
Here is revealed with beauty and sensitivity, a world of miracles and connections we can only marvel at, a world that reaches out staggering but still alive, despite the havoc of the covered wagons and cultural abuse. His characters twist and turn the imagination as they reveal slowly the wonders of the natural world and our relationships within it. Kent's work has been my companion and will always remain so, otherworldly and ever more valuable to us in the confusion of these modern times, this voicing of the remarkable spirit of an amazing people. Nice oh, that, work, huh? That is wonderful. Yeah. That is wonderful. Yeah, and he thought he had nothing. He said, it's just a scratch. <laughs> I, I can't write. Well, you know, like I said, he's, he's quite an unusual man. Not at all what you would have expected. Uh, so uh, anyway, I, I found him as a valuable friend now. And uh, it's, it's been very helpful because, uh, you know, people might say, you know, they say, well, I got this book by Kent Nervin. Who's Kent Nervin? I don't know. I never heard of him. Well, there's an introduction by Robert Plant. They say, oh, Robert Plant. My God. I know who that is. And yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So he, he that's right. He, he, he opens a wide door for this book. And hopefully by his, uh, by his endorsement, it will bring people to it. And they will see through me some of the native world that uh, we all need to learn about. Another uh, place that this book has had a lot of um, effect, impact, maybe, is is in our prisons. Um, yes. I, and the Native American population is definitely overrepresented in our prison system, at least here in the Midwest. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I feel, sometimes I really feel that that's, that's a crime. Well, you know, and, and that's been to me one of the when I when I look and, and think, okay, I've done I've done some good with this book. Um, this book, I mean, on several occasions, the in, in Minnesota, the Department of Corrections has had me come and speak to their conferences about about this book and about the Native experience because the Native liaison with the prisons had been in, in, in some of the prisons in Minnesota and the native people had this book. Uh, you know, they, they can't be given things directly, but if they're sent wrapped by publishers and so forth, they can have them. And the book had been passed around in the prisons and the, the prisoners were giving it to the guards saying, you need this to understand who we are and what our spirituality is. And some of the things that, you know, that I didn't even know about until I got involved with uh, getting the book into the prisons are things like how their spiritual leaders are not allowed, at least at the early on, weren't allowed into the prisons because they didn't have some sanctioning, some certification, like a, a, a Protestant minister, a Catholic priest, a rabbi, where they can say, okay, this person is defined as a religious leader. Their religious leaders aren't like that. And so they wouldn't let the people into the uh, prison and wouldn't let them uh, counsel and, and run ceremonies. Now a lot of this has changed. But this is the kind of thing that just no, that no one even looked at. And the Native people are represented, you know, or way overrepresented in our prison system. And if this book helps them to help the guards and the prison system be more humane and more understanding in its treatment of the native prisoners, then you know, it's been a good thing. And just a little side, a little side note, uh, Stearns County, where St. Cloud, Minnesota is, but I think it was the sheriff that refused to let the book in the prison because he said it's a, he said it's a subversive book, uh, oh which I, you know, which I, I, I actually was uh, was rather proud to hear that he felt it was a subversive <laughs> book. I wasn't happy that it wasn't there, but it was pretty right. astonishing to me. And wow. spoke to what a rough life those prisoners must have. Uh, St. Cloud is where the St. Cloud uh, State Prison is. And uh, I don't know whether that was one of the prisons that couldn't have it, but I know that the Stearns County uh, Sheriff was the one that said, nope, this book doesn't go near my prisoners. Oh my gosh. Well, I have a, fr a friend who's a native man in the Iowa State Penitentiary and I'm mm -hmm. going to I will be sending him your book. Oh, and, that would be great. Yeah, and I I know that, you know, they have the lodge there. They're allowed to have their ceremonies, but the um, mm -hmm. the person who comes in from outside is not 
someone they actually want or respect and um, but they can't they don't seem to have any ability to get the state to and, and someone who's like employed by the state I think and right they don't have any way to to get somebody who actually knows what they're doing and <laughs> right, and and what what a tough thing it is to say that you know, this isn't our spiritual leader. You can't just uh, import yeah. you know, a, a, a rent to Indian and bring him in here. And then and I think of some of the things that I was told about the uh, the older times, uh, and that's not that many years ago, where uh, they wouldn't let them uh, bring pipes uh, or uh, any sort of tobacco into the prison because they said, well, they might hide it in their long hair and we don't want any, we, they might hide weapons in their long hair and they didn't see that the hair was seen as a part of their whole spiritual tradition and that they grew their hair long in respect for nature and mother earth. And very often in some of the tribes, they would only cut it off at times beef and morning. And none of this was anywhere available in the sort of cognitive uh, reality of the people running the prisons. They wouldn't let them set up sweat lodges because they thought they might be burying something in the earth underneath them. They'd only want them to set them up on concrete. Uh, just you know, oh, wow. just crazy stuff. And yet none of this, oh, and they wouldn't, in some of the prisons, they wouldn't let non-Native people come to the ceremonies. Uh, even if they wanted to, if they wanted to uh, be part of, if the Native people invited them and they wanted them to be part of the Native spirituality, they'd say, no, you're not Native. You can't come. Uh, you can't go to those ceremonies. But yet if one of them, if a Native person wanted to go to, uh, to uh, what, a Lutheran service or something, sure, come on, we'll let you do that because they think in that case they're getting uh, some sort of spiritual education and edification. But it wow. didn't go the other way. And this kind of thing just goes on and on and on. And it all has to do with the blindness. Like I said, it's to see through two different sets of eyes. And we only see through our sets of eyes, set of eyes. And uh, my whole hope is that through my work, I can have us start to look past our own uh, frame of reference and start to see through other people's way of understanding, which often has much, uh, much wisdom to offer us all. Well, Kent, before we run out of time, why don't you share a little bit from your work, from Neither Wolf Nor Dog. All right, I will read a passage. I think it's a couple pages long here uh, about Dan. Uh, it's, it's one of the first talks he gives to me. Uh, and he says to me, Nervin, come here. It's time for you to learn something. I approached him tentatively. Sit down, he ordered. It was a gentle command, but firm. I sat down quietly. Turn on that tape recorder, he said. Then he began to speak. Let me tell you how we lost the land. Let me tell you the real story. The white people surprised us when they came. Those of us out west had heard about them. Some of our elders had told prophecies about them, but still they surprised us. We had seen other strangers before, but they were just other people like us, other Indians from different tribes. They would come and ask us to pass through our land. If we wanted them to, we would let them. Otherwise, they couldn't. But you see, it wasn't our land like we owned it. It was the land where we hunted and where our ancestors were buried. It was the land that the Creator had given us. It was the land where our sacred stories took place. It had sacred places on it. Our ceremonies were here. We knew the ancestors. They knew us. We had watched the seasons pass up this land. It was alive, like our grandparents. It gave us life for our bodies and the life for our spirits. We were part of it. So we would let people pass through it if they needed to, because it was our land and they knew it. But we did not wish them to hunt or disturb our sacred places. But they would come to our land if they needed to. You need to understand this. We did not think we owned the land. The land was part of us. We didn't even know about owning the land. It was like talking about owning your grandmother. You can't own your grandmother. She just is your grandmother. Why would you talk about owning her? So when you're the first of your people came, they just wanted to go through. They were strange to us. They wore strange clothes. They smelled different, but they had many powers we had never seen. They were part of the Creator's plan, we thought. It was not our place to deny them because it was not our right to control them. We were just living our lives. They promised they would not do any damage. 
They were like a new kind of warrior with guns and different weapons. They were strange because they were always searching. He thought they would just come and go. We thought they'd come among us and we fed them and helped them. They were like raindrops that fell out of the sky and then stopped and were gone. But soon other strangers came. This time they were like a stream. They came with horses and wagons. They went on paths to our land. Still, it did not bother us except it scared the animals and that only these people did not know what was sacred. But we knew they had to eat, so we did not mind when they shot the buffalo. I've heard that it was same for, the same for other tribes with other animals. They tried to help these people. They were worried that the animals for the hunt would be scared away. But these people brought guns, and that made hunting easier for us, so we did not mind. But then these strangers shot animals just to kill them. They left them lying in gullies. They made paths to the lands that were heavier than our paths. These people became like a river through the land. We had never seen the kind of things they did. For us, the earth was alive. To move a stone was to change her. To go kill an animal was to take from her. There had to be respect. We saw no respect from these people. They chopped down trees and left animals lying where they were shot. They made loud noises. They seemed like wild people. They were heavy on the land and they were loud. We could hear their wagon wheels groaning in the next valley. We tried to stay out of their way, but they made us angry. They made hunting hard for us. They took food from our children's mouths. We did not want them around. Still, they were on small paths and we were free. We tried to leave them alone except for the young men who were most angry. And we did want their rifles. Then something strange happened. These new people started asking us for the land. We did not know what to say. How could they ask for the land? They wanted to give us money for the land. They would give us money for the land if the people could live on it. Our people didn't want this. There was something wrong to the creator in taking money for the land. There was something wrong to our grandparents and our ancestors to take money for the land. Then something happened that we didn't understand. The people who came said that we didn't belong here anymore, that there was a chief in Washington, which was a city far away. And the land was his, and he had said that they could live here, and we could not. He thought they were insane. The elders said that he had said to be careful of these people because they were dangerous. Most of us just laughed. At least this is what the elders told me when I was young. These people would ride across the land and put a flag up, then say everything between where they started and where they put the flag belonged to them. That was like something someone rolling a boat out into a lake and saying that all the water from where he started to where he turned around belonged to him. Or someone shooting an arrow into the sky and saying that all the sky up to where the arrow went belonged to him. This is very important for you to understand. We thought these people were crazy. We thought we must not understand them right. What they said made no sense. And here's what was really happening. They were talking about property. We were talking about the land. You see what I mean? Your people came from Europe because they wanted property for their own. This is what they needed to farm and raise the food to live. They had worked for other people who had claimed all the property and took all the things they raised. They never had anything because they had no property. That was what they wanted more than anything. That is what was behind the whole idea of America as a new country across the ocean to get property of their own. I don't know, maybe long, long ago, Europe was just land, too, like the land was for us. But that was so long ago that no one remembered. All It had all been turned into property. If people didn't have property, they didn't have very much control over their lives, because everyone believed that whoever had a piece of paper saying they owned the land could control everything that happened on it. The people that came across the ocean believed this, too. They came here to get their own property. We didn't know this. We didn't even know what it meant. We just belong to the land. They wanted to own it. And here's what I think is important. Your religion didn't come from the land. It could be carried around with you. You couldn't understand what it meant for us to have our religion in the land. Your religion was a cup and a cup and a piece of bread that could be carried in a box. Your priests could make it sacred anywhere. You couldn't understand that what was sacred for us is where we were, because that is where the sacred things had happened where the spirits talked to us. The people did not know about the land being sacred. We did not know about the land being property. We could not talk to each other because we did not understand each other. But pretty soon your people were not like a stream or even a great river anymore. 
They were like a great ocean. This ocean washed us back upon each other. It washed us off our land. And that was Kent Nurburn reading from Neither Wolf Nor Dog. I just found an article in the, this Catholic Messenger paper about uh, a, a missionary that, that uh, was trying to uh, um, work with some in, in indigenous people in uh, northern Canada, and they weren't they, they were nice to him, but they wouldn't show up for appointments. And so he asked one of the elders why, and, they, and the elder said, well, you have to stay here a while. And, and and then they'll get to know you and know they can trust you and you're not just a tourist. And, you know, that it just, it's, it's exactly, it's still happening. It's still happening today. What happened back then, same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, you know, that's one of, I think, the reason why I've been able to uh, do the work I've done is because the, the native people learn their way of understanding the world. It, it's observation. They learn from the animals. The animals have always been their teachers. And animals don't trust immediately. They want to watch. They want to observe, see who you are, see your characters, your characteristics, and then decide whether they want to approach. And the only way to really operate successfully as a non-native person in the native community, to me, is to just be present. You have to be let yourself be seen. Um, I mean, we tend to. I, I remember hearing Wilma Mankiller, the head of the Cherokees, who died recently, say, "White people have such an amazing sense of entitlement. They think just because their hearts are pure, they can go anywhere, do anything, and ask anything." Well, that's really true. We do think a pure heart allows us entree to people, but it doesn't. What allows us entree to people is when we approach them as if we are guests in their world and have to wait until we're uh, until we're offered the chance to come in. And when the door is open to us, then we go in, but not until. And I've always sort of, it's just been in my character to always sort of stay back and watch. And, you know, and, and that was, uh, and just to keep showing up, I call it, you know, the bad cat syndrome. I just keep showing up on the porch <laughs> and eventually uh, you know, they let me in. But you have to let yourself be seen. You can't talk your way into words. Don't uh, open someone's heart. All they do is that they're they can be used to trick you. They can dissemble. You just have to let yourself be seen. And uh, I remember one last uh, one last thing I'll say on that is uh, when when there was years ago there was a man trying to make a movie of this. His name was John Irvin. He was a Hollywood director, and uh, I went to. out to where he was filming uh, something in the South Dakota. And anyway, I got talking to some of the Indian people and trying to tell them my uh, my background and why they should trust me and so forth. And one of the guys said, "Don't sh- show me your heart. Don't give me your resume. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the reality. Yeah. If you've got a good heart and you show it, then if they want to let you in, they will. But your resume will never get you in anywhere. And I think that's what that person in the north country of Canada, when Canada was actually seeing. Show us your heart, not your enemy. Wow. Well, thank you, Kent. We're out of time, and uh, we have so much more we could talk about. Oh, gosh, um, yes. You'll just have to get the book, Neither Wolf Nor Dog, on Forgotten Roads with an Indian Elder, if you want to learn more about, about this story. And, Mom, do you have some closing words for us? I do. Uh, This is one of Dan's... uh, things that he said always teach by story because stories lodge deep in the heart thank you Kent for being with us today well thank you for having me and I hope some of your listeners will find this book and look through it into a world that uh, is the ground on which we walk is belongs to these people and we are guests here and it's good for us and it's good for us to know what their world is like and what they understand so thank you for having me I'm very very honored to have done this and see you all next week on Writer's Voices Mm -hmm.